Good evening. I'm Michael Silverblatt. What a pleasure it is to be back in Santa Fe. I, I honestly wait from event to event. I think this may be the 30th event, but I may be including some that happened in Los Angeles. But this is a very, very special night. Not only am I walking on a fractured ankle, um, but I'm walking on a fractured ankle because I came here to introduce someone that I admire greatly, whose work I've been watching develop, that sounds wrong. A writer lives, a real writer lives in our midst in Los Angeles. She moved to Los Angeles, Rachel Kushner, before her first novel appeared. I have been fascinated by her for a long time. At the very first barbecue at which I met her, she told me and the people around her that she wasn't interested in good girls, that she was happy to be in a place, Los Angeles, where the writers weren't talking about their agents, and that she herself was a bad girl. She later at another party displayed a map of places where she'd been bad. It was very interesting <laughs> to m meet her because, you know, those of us who've been overeducated have been taught to be so good <laughs> all the time. Good, kind, thoughtful, generous. Rachel Kushner writes a kind of book in this most recent book called The Mars Room that laid me flat because while she's talking about people who might conventionally be called bad, her compassion for them is so deep and her recognition that that compassion is the result of matters of class, of poverty, of ethnicity, all of the things that we are trying today to face in America are the subject of the Mars Room. I'll tell you a secret, now, no stampedes, but this book isn't coming out until May 1st, and there are copies of it here. You will not be able to buy it until May 1st, so get the copies that are here. I couldn't stop reading it once I started. It held me prisoner. It is a book about incarceration. It is a book, I want to say women's prisons, but there are so many different kinds of women, and this book exposes you to the transgender women, the women who were only strippers who had to fight against those men who stalked them and eventually were thrown into prison without anything but public representation, people who were not adequate to protect. Most of the people in prison in America, but especially in California, an astonishing number do not belong there. They're the result of the so-called war on drugs, so-called ideas about what a woman should be like. As she points out in the book, when a man looks normal, he's just a guy, but when a woman looks just normal, she looks cheap and is thought to be a woman who disregards her children. The attitudes toward women that are eviscerated in this book are so powerful. This is a writer who spent, I think, the last two to three years traveling from prison to prison undercover 
as a criminologist, as an ongoing criminologist. And she's put together a novel that I think is unforgettable. You will be hearing about this book in 20 years. This book, this is rare. This is a book that we will be reading for a very long time. This captures our moment. It's written in a language that anyone can understand. You know, Rachel's last book dazzled me by its knowledge of both Italian Revolution and downtown New York art. All you have to know to read The Mars Room is something about being human. And that is an accomplishment. Thank you. That was a nice introduction. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to thank Michael for coming here with a broken ankle. Um, and I'd like to thank the Lannan Foundation for having me. Um, it is so bright, I can't see anything. Um, <clears throat> and they would not let me read in my sunglasses. Um, I was only in Santa Fe one time 30 years ago, so um, just to take things to a little goofier level, I walked around this afternoon and I kept thinking, I looked, I didn't buy anything, but I passed all those shops and I thought, what if I walk out on stage in a Navajo poncho, cowboy boots, <laughs> dried chili peppers hanging around my neck, <laughs> carrying a geode, <laughs> and I wondered if anybody would notice or if I would just fit right in. Um, no, I like the style a lot. I just, you know, if you, you, you can't get the whole thing of living here just by buying that stuff. You got to do the life that goes with it, right? Uh, so I'm going to read from my new book, The Mars Room, a few different places in it. <clears throat> This is the opening. Chain night happens once a week on Thursdays. Once a week, the defining moment for 60 women takes place. For some of the 60, that defining moment happens over and over. For them, it is routine. For me, it happened only once. I was woken at 2 a.m. and shackled and counted Romy Leslie Hall, inmate W314159, and lined up with the others for an all-night ride up the valley. As our bus exited the jail perimeter, I glued myself to the mesh-reinforced window to try to see the world. There wasn't much to look at. Underpasses and on-ramps, dark, deserted boulevards. No one was on the street. We were passing through a moment in the night so remote that traffic lights had ceased to go from green to red and merely blinked a constant yellow. Another car came alongside. It had no lights. It surged past the bus, a dark thing with demonic energy. There was a girl on my unit in county who got life for nothing but driving. She wasn't the shooter. All she did was drive the car. That was it. They'd used license plate reader technology. They had it on video surveillance. What they had was an image of the car at night moving along a street, first with lights on, then with lights off. If the driver cuts the lights, that is premeditation. If the driver cuts the lights, it's murder. They were moving us at that hour for a reason, for many reasons. If they could have shot us to the prison in a capsule, they would have. Anything to shield the regular people from having to look at us, a crew of cuffed and chained women on a sheriff's department bus. Some of the younger ones were whimpering and sniffling as we pulled onto the highway. There was a girl in a cage who looked about eight months pregnant, her belly so large they had, a, they had to get an extra length of waist chain to shackle her hands to her sides. She hiccuped and shook, her face a mess of tears. They had her in the cage on account of her age to protect her from the rest of us. She was 15. A woman up ahead turned toward the crying girl in the cage and hissed like she was spraying ant killer. When that didn't work, she yelled. 
Shut the hell up. Dang, the person across from me said. I'm from San Francisco, and a trans to me is nothing new, but this person truly looked like a man, shoulders as broad as the aisle, and a jawline beard. I assumed she was from the daddy tank at County, where they put the butches. This was Conan, who later I got to know. Dang, I mean, it's a kid. Let her cry. The woman told Conan to shut up, and then they were arguing, and the cops intervened. Certain women in jail and prison make rules for everyone else, and the woman insisting on quiet was one of those. If you follow their rules, they make more rules. You have to fight people, or you end up with nothing. I had learned already not to cry. Two years earlier, when I was arrested, I cried uncontrollably. My life was over, and I knew it was over. It was my first night in jail, and I kept hoping the dreamlike state of my situation would break, that I would wake up from it. I kept on not waking up into anything different from a piss-smelling mattress and slamming doors, shouting lunatics and alarms. The girl in the cell with me, who was not a lunatic, shook me roughly to get my attention. I looked up. She turned around and lifted her jail shirt to show me her low back tattoo, her tramp stamp. It said, shut the fuck up. It worked on me. I stopped crying. It was a gentle moment with my cellmate in county. She wanted to help me. It's not everyone who can shut the fuck up. And although I tried, I was not my cellmate, who I later considered a kind of saint, not for the tattoo, but the loyalty to the mandate. The cops had put me with another white woman on the bus. My seatmate had long, limp, and shiny brown hair and a big, creepy smile like she was advertising for tooth whitener. Few in jail and prison have white teeth, and neither did she, but she had that grand and inappropriate grin. I didn't like it. It made her seem like she had undergone partial brain removal surgery. She offered her full name, Laura Lip and said she was being transferred from Chino up to Stanville as if we each had nothing to hide. Since then, no one has ever introduced themselves to me by full name or attempted to give any believable seeming account of who they are on first introduction, and no one would, and I don't either. Lip Double P is my father, excuse me, Lip Double P is my stepfather's name, which I took later, she said as if I'd inquired as if such a thing could matter to me, then or ever. My father, father was a Culpepper. That's the Culpeppers of Apple Valley, not Victorville. There's a Culpeper shoe repair seat in Victorville, but there's no relation. No one is supposed to talk on the bus. This rule did not stop her. My family goes back three generations in Apple Valley, which sounds like a wonderful place, doesn't it? You can practically smell the apple blossoms and hear the honeybees, and it makes you think about fresh apple cider and warm apple pie. The autumn decorations, they start putting up every July at Craft Cubby, bright leaves and plastic pumpkins. It is mostly the baking and preparing of meth that is traditional in Apple Valley. <laughs> Not in my family. Don't want to give you the wrong impression. The Culpeppers are useful people. My father owned his own construction business. Not like the family I married into who, oh, oh, look. It's Magic Mountain. We were passing the white arcs of a roller coaster on the far side of the big multi-lane freeway. When I'd moved to Los Angeles three years earlier, that amusement park had seemed like the gateway to my new life. It was the first big vision off the freeway hurtling south, bright and ugly and exciting, but that no longer mattered. There was a lady on my unit who stole children at Magic Mountain, Laura Lip said. She and her sicko husband. She had a way of flipping her shiny sheet of hair without using her arms, as if the hair were attached to the rest of her by an electrical current. She told me how they did it. People trusted her and her husband because they were old. You know, sweet, gentle, elderly people. And a mother might have children running in three directions and go off to chase one, and the old lady, I bunked with her at CIW, and she told me the whole story. She would be sitting there knitting and offered to keep an eye on the child. As soon as the parent was out of sight, this child was escorted to a bathroom with a knife under his chin. This old lady and her husband had a system worked out. The kid was fitted with a wig, different clothes, and then that sneaky old couple muscled the poor thing out of the park. That's horrible, I said, 
and tried to lean away from her as best I could in my chains. I have a child of my own, Jackson. I love my son, but it's hard for me to think about him. I try not to. My mother named me after a German actress who told a bank robber on a television talk show host, excuse me, television talk show that she liked him a lot. Very much, the actress said. I like you very much. Like the German actress, he was on the talk show to be interviewed. Interviewees did not generally cross-talk while sitting on the chairs to the left of the interviewer's desk. They moved outward as the show progressed. You start outward, some prick had said to me once about silverware. It wasn't a thing I'd ever learned or been taught. He was paying for the date with me, and in this exchange, he felt he didn't get his money's worth unless he found small ways to try to humiliate me over the course of the evening. Leaving his hotel room that night, I took a shopping bag that was by the door. He didn't notice, figured he was off duty from the vigilance of demeaning me, and could luxuriate in the hotel bed. The bag was from Saks Fifth Avenue and contained many other bags, all with presents for a woman, I assumed his wife. Dowdy and expensive clothes I would never wear. I carried the bag through the lobby and shoved it in a trash can on the way to my car, which I'd parked several blocks away in a garage on mission because I didn't want this guy knowing anything about me. The outward chair of the TV show's set held a bank robber who was on the show to talk about his past, and the German movie actress was on next, and she turned to the bank robber and told him that she liked him. My mother named me after this actress, who spoke to the bank robber instead of to the host. Our bus moved into the right lane and began to slow. We were getting off at the Magic Mountain exit. They'd taken us on rides? Conan asked. That would be dope. Magic Mountain was left across the freeway. Right was a men's county correctional facility. Our bus turned right. The world had split into good and bad, bound together, amusement park and county jail. It's cool, Conan said. Wasn't really up for it. Tickets hella expensive. Rather go back to the Big O, Orlando. Listen to this fool, someone said. You ain't been to no Orlando. I dropped 20 G there, Conan said. In three days, brought my girl, her kids, jacuzzi suite, all access pass, alligator steaks. Orlando is dope. A lot doper than this bus, that's for sure. Thought they were taking you to Magic Mountain, the woman in front of Conan said. Stupid motherfucker. She had a face full of tattoos. Dang, you got a lot of ink. Just looking at this group of us here, I'm voting you most likely to succeed. She clucked and turned away. What I eventually came to understand about San Francisco was that I was immersed in beauty and barred from seeing it. Still, I never could bring myself to leave, not until my regular customer, Kurt Kennedy, forced me to, but the curse of the city followed me. In other ways, she was a miserable person, this actress after whom I am named. Her son climbed a fence and cut a leg artery and died at 14, and then she drank continuously until dying herself at 43. I'm 29. 14 years is forever if that's what I have to live. In any case, it's more than twice that, 37 years, before I will see a parole board, at which point, if they grant me it, I can start my second life sentence. I have two consecutive life sentences plus six years. I don't plan on living a long life, or a short life, necessarily. I have no plans at all. The thing is, you keep existing whether you have a plan to do so or not until you don't exist, and then your plans are meaningless. But not having plans means I, doesn't mean I don't have regrets. If I had never worked at the Mars Room, if I had never met Creep Kennedy, if Creep Kennedy had not decided to stalk me, but he did decide to, and then he did it relentlessly. If none of that had happened, I would not be on a bus heading for a life in a concrete slot. We were at a stoplight past the off-ramp. Outside the window, a mattress leaned against a pepper tree. Even those two things, I told myself, must go together. 
No pepper trees, lacy branches, without dirty old mattresses leaned up against their puzzle bark trunks. All good, bound to bad, and made bad. All bad. I used to think those were mine every time, Laura Lip said, peering out at the abandoned mattress. I'd be driving around Los Angeles and see a mattress on the sidewalk and think, hey, somebody stole my box spring. I'd think, there's my bed. There's my bed. Every time, because honestly, it looked just like mine. I'd go home and my bed would be where I left it in the bedroom. I'd tear the covers and sheets off to check the mattress and be sure, see if it was still mine, and every time, it was. I always found it still there at home, despite having just seen my exact mattress flopped out on the street. I have a feeling I am not the only one and that this is something like a mass confusion. The fact is they cover all the mattresses with the same exact material and quilt them the same way, and you can't help but think it's yours when you see it dumped at a freeway exit. Like, what the hell did they drag my bed out here for? We passed a lit billboard. Three suits, $129. It was the name of a business. Three suits, $129. They'll hook you up at that place, walk out looking like a baller, Conan said. Where they get this fool, someone said, talking about cheap-ass suits. Where did they get any of us? Only each of us knew, and no one was telling. No one but Laura Lip. You want to know what they did with the children? Laura Lip asked me. That old lady and her sicko husband at Magic Mountain? No, I said. You won't believe it, she continued. It's inhuman. They... An announcement exploded through the bus PA. We were to remain seated. The bus was stopping to let off the three men caged separately near the front. Guns were pointed at them and at us while the transfer took place. Crazy mothers up here, Conan said. I was in six months. The woman in front of Conan got excited, as in mad. You a dude for real, for real shit. Officer, officer. Settle down, Conan said. I'm in the right place. I mean, the wrong place. Nothing right about it, but they fixed my file. They were confused and put me, put me with the caballeros downtown at Men's Central. It was an honest oops. There was laughing and snickering. They put you in the men's joint? They thought you were an actual dude? Not just county. I was at Wasco State Prison. Disbelief rippled down the aisle. Conan did not challenge it. Later, I learned the details. Conan really was at a men's prison, at least in receiving. He truly did seem like a man, and that was how I thought of him from the moment I met him. Back on the highway, I turned from Laura Lip as far as I could and closed my eyes. Five minutes into my attempt to sleep, she started whispering to me again. This whole situation is because I'm bipolar, she said. In case you were wondering, you probably are. It's chromosomal. Or maybe she said chromosomical, because that was the kind of people I had to be around now. People who thought everything was a scientifical conspiracy. I didn't meet a single person in county who wasn't convinced that AIDS had been invented by the government to wipe out gays and addicts. It got difficult to argue with. In a sense, it seemed true. The woman who had been hissing and shushing everyone turned around as best she could in her restraints. She had a faded and blurry teardrop tattoo and pencil-drawn eyebrows. Her eyes glowed a grayish green like this was a zombie film and not a bus ride to a California state prison. She's a baby killer, she called to us, or maybe to me. She was talking about Laura Lip. A transport cop came down the aisle. Well, if it ain't Fernandez, he said, I hear one more word from you, I'll put you in a cage. Fernandez didn't look at him or respond. He returned to his seat. Laura made a face, a slight smile, as if something mildly embarrassing but not worth acknowledging had just taken place like someone had accidentally passed gas, definitely not her. Dang, you killed your child, Conan said. That is fucked up. Hope I don't have to room with you. I'd guess you've got bigger problems than a roommate assignment, Laura Lip said to Conan. 
You look like the kind of person who spends a lot of time in prisons and jails. Why you say that? Because I'm black? At least I fit in here. You look like a Manson chick. No offense. I got nothing to hide. Here's my file. Counter rehabilitatable. ODD, that's Oppositional Defiant Disorder. I'm criminal-minded, narcissistic, recidivistical, and uncooperative. I'm also a prunaholic and horn dog. People had quieted into themselves, and eventually some fell asleep. Conan was snoring like a bulldozer. We have some real characters up going up valley with us, Laura whispered to me. And listen, I'm no Manson girl, and I know what I'm talking about. I know the difference. We had Susan Atkins and Leslie Van Hooten at CIW. They both had the scar in between their eyes. Susan put a special cream on hers, but nothing hit it. She was an uppity snob with an X carved in her forehead. Had fine things in her cell. Fancy perfumes, a touch lamp. There's a touch lamp in my room. I just want to let you know that. I mean, my room here in Santa Fe. I felt bad when one of the girls got a guard to pop Susan's cell and they took all her nice stuff. That's what I thought about when I heard she'd died, missing part of her brain and paralyzed and they still wouldn't let her go home. When I heard about it, I thought of them popping her cell at CIW, taking her touch lamp and her lotions. Leslie Van Hooten is more of what you'd call a convict. Some people think that's a term of respect, but not to me. It's nothing but groupthink. She'll die in prison just like Susan Atkins did. This is Laura talking, by the way. They aren't letting her out, not until Folger's coffee isn't brewed anymore, and that's as good as never, because what are people going to drink in the morning? <laughs> One of the victims was an heiress of Folger's, see? And they don't want Leslie out, and they are individuals of high influence. As long as there is Folger's, Leslie will die in prison. Um, so that's from the first chapter. And then I was going to just read a short kind of interlude that appears a bit later in the book. Please provide employment history over the last five years. Please be thorough and detailed. On the job experience section of the form, the suspect wrote that she had experience as an employee. The intake officer explained that this would not be sufficient. On the transcript of the suspect's interview with homicide detectives, when asked what kind of work he normally did, the suspect answered, recycling. Quality control, she wrote for type of work. I'm an employee, he told them, but seemed unable to specify what kind. Recycler, maintenance crew, retail, wholesale, flyer distribution, warehouse distribution, dollar store, dollar tree, distribution warehouse, Walmart. He said he handed out flyers. He had written recycler. They both worked with a crew that handed out flyers. He delivered free newspapers, but not regularly. He worked at a distribution warehouse. She wrote quality control. He said he worked part-time helping a friend who cleaned dollar stores after hours. Cashier, unemployed, not currently employed. QC, which she explained meant quality control. Truck unloader, package handler. He unpacked crates, he told them, at a distribution warehouse. When asked what she did for a living, the suspect said she worked. Recycling, he'd written. He brought recycling to a redemption center, he explained. Recycler, 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 recycler. Redemptions, he told them. Redeemer was what she wrote. The suspect said she had mostly made her living by collecting bottles and cans. Um, moving to a different... Uh, Different section of the book, um, the woman that she meets on the bus who yells at the young girl to shut up ends up becoming a friend. Uh, her name is Sammy. So this is the narrator, Romy, talking about Sammy's past. I never know if you're allowed to actually drink the water or if it's just there for show. <laughs> 
Sammy's crime, uh, wait, let me see, I have 20 minutes. Actually, I'll start one page earlier and give you some context. Oh, so she and Sammy end up in administrative segregation, which is like the jail inside prison. There's also a prison of prison, which is called the secure housing unit. Um, they're in the jail of prison, which means they're confined to their cell. Um, <clears throat> and they are above death row, so they can see down from their tier into death row. They're let out twice a week to shower. Other times when we showered, they were on the two phones down there on death row, or waiting for the phones, talking to journalists and lawyers, Sammy explained. The women on death row worked the media and were always communicating with folks in the outside world. They knew all kinds of people on account of who they were. They led people on and suggested they might consent to interviews or visits, promises they did not plan to keep. They weren't interested in doing interviews. They were interested in having people to call, people who wanted something from them. It felt good to be pursued. It was a game to get attention, a game that was not a game because it was all they had. We were not allowed mail or phone calls in ADSEG, that's administrative segregation. Still, I felt lucky compared to those women downstairs talking to the Fresno Bee. My mother would come to the prison with Jackson as soon as I was allowed a visit after I was done with this ADSEG term and transferred to general population. She would put money on my books so that I could buy what I needed, coffee and toothpaste and stamps in order to survive. Sammy kept telling me how important it was to have someone on the outside, but I didn't let her know I had support or that I had two life sentences. It was no one's business but mine. Like in the dressing room at the Mars room, you don't give your real name, you don't offer information, you don't talk about yourself because there is nothing to be gained from it. Sammy had been back in ADSEG the night that Candy Pena received her execution papers. Candy had to choose which method she preferred and sign the form. Sammy listened to Candy Pena cry as she read the paper that offered her gas or injection. We turned out our lights to protest, Sammy said, and everyone on ADSEG refused their dinner tray. It creates a lot of paperwork for the staff. They have to fill out forms for every person who refuses her tray. Candy was screaming over and over. Everyone on ADSEG and death row was crying. Even the guards were crying. There was one handicapped lady who accepted her tray, but I think she just didn't understand what was going on. Candy chose lethal injection. Candy Pena had knifed a little girl. She was out of her mind on meth and PCP when it happened. She prayed daily, hourly, minute by minute at the altar she'd made in her death row cell to honor the little girl. She cried and signed the papers, and Sammy was a human, if sometimes a bully, and she felt for Candy. You go to ADSEG, and you don't stop having feelings. You hear a woman cry, and it's real. It's not a courtroom where they ask all the pertinent and wrong questions, the niggling repeated demands for details to sort contradiction and establish intent. The quiet of the cell is where the real question lingers in the mind of a woman. The one true question, impossible to answer. The why did you? The how? Not the practical how, the other one. How could you have done such a thing? How could you? Sammy's crime was that she'd wet the bed. She told me all about it. I know I said you don't give out personal data, but Sammy told me everything. When I was four, we lived in a trailer and there was no electricity because my mother was an addict and had to spend whatever money she could on dope. At night, I would pee in the bed to warm it up. I got a rash on my legs. A neighbor saw my legs and called CPS. Child Protective Services took Sammy away. She was in and out of group homes and wound up in youth authority where she learned to fight. You get a lot of skills there you'll need for prison. By 12, she was out of YA, back with her mom, and turning tricks to support her mother's habit. The men liked young company. Her first sugar daddy was a bail bondsman named Maldonado. She eventually got strung out herself, was arrested, took a narcotics number, a never-never number, she called it, and had been in and out of prison ever since on sales and trafficking charges. Her mother was long dead. Many people she'd been in YA with were here at Stanville. Her network was extensive. It was a lifetime of prison connections. 
Sammy had paroled six months earlier. Her time out of prison had been brief. She was eager to mainline and reclaim her possessions. She had a television, a personal fan, a stinger to heat water. She'd given her things away, but on the condition that if she returned, she'd be able to repossess. She knew her leaves from prison were just that, not departures, but vacations. But she had not expected to be back quite so soon. Sammy had been released to a new husband, a guy she met through the mail. It all started with a letter he wrote, but not to Sammy. He'd written the letter to another woman inside Stanville, and that woman treated the letter as currency, something to sell to another prisoner who wanted a pen pal. People were always looking for pen pals. Someone would surely pay to start an exchange with this guy. The letter had been read by so many women when it got to Sammy that its pages were tearing on the crease lines where it had been folded and refolded. The letter and its writer, Keith something, I never cut the last name, had potential. And so the woman who had received his letter kept raising the price. When the letter got to Sammy, bidding for it had risen to over $50. The high bidder would get the envelope with Keith's return address. Sammy told me that as soon as she started to read it, she knew that letter was worth more than $50, a lot more. His writing was like a third grader's, she said, with a grave tone as if to suggest that such a thing denoted immense value. Even his own name was misspelled, she said. K-E-A-T-H? Who the fuck spells it that way? Keith had victim written all over him and his misspelled name. The woman selling the letter had used a photo of a high school beauty queen on her prison pen pal page. People put up photos they found or traded, someone's daughter, someone's cousin, someone, not themselves. It was crucial to have runners, people who sent you money inside. One way to get runners was to find men to write to you. Keith had written to what he thought was this high school beauty queen, but was merely a woman who had used that photo. She was an elderly prisoner who'd suffered throat cancer and had a mechanical larynx. She held a battery-operated box to her neck to negotiate a price with Sammy, who offered her CD player as payment. The woman handed over the envelope with Keith's address. Sammy wrote to Keith and introduced herself, said she'd felt an instant connection when she'd read his letter. A courtship began. She was paroling in a few months and needed not your typical runner, but someone to go home to. An apartment, financial stability, and proof of gainful employment, or the parole board would never let her free. Sammy had an old boyfriend named Rodney who might set her up at his place in Compton, but Rodney hit her, she told me, and she was done with that. Keith started to seem like the answer. Keith said he had been in the Air Force and flew planes and had a good military pension. When he came to the prison for the first time, he proposed to Sammy. He was a big, lumbering, and doughy white boy with a wandering eye. She said yes, but could not bring herself to let him kiss her in the visiting room. Like the rest of us, she'd done all kinds of sex work, but she couldn't let this innocent dope plant one on her cheek. She told him she'd lost her privileges and could not hug or kiss. Keith believed it. Oh, golly, I don't want to get you in trouble, he said. Why don't we just shake hands? She paroled. They married at a county courthouse not far from Stanville in Hanford, a dusty farming town where Keith's father sold tractor equipment. His family had fixed up an apartment for them and made everything in it blue because Sammy had said it was her favorite color. Blue curtains, blue couch, blue microwavable bowls. She didn't have a favorite color. She was just saying things to Keith that she thought he wanted to hear. She'd said blue because it was what she was wearing that day in the visiting room, like every other prisoner in the visiting room. <laughs> there she was, a Mexican girl from Estrada Courts in East LA, living in a small town in the Central Valley with a corny white husband who, it turned out, had never flown planes, never been in the Air Force, and instead spent all day watching car racing on TV. He said he was going to Daytona, talked incessantly about Daytona, once a month, he filled out his SSI forms with his left hand so the government would think he was slow, even slower than he already was. 
His big, doughy, small-town family didn't know anything about Sammy and didn't ask where it was Keith had met her. He took her to a picnic down the I-5. It was a gathering for people who liked to pretend they were fighting the Civil War. There were log cabins where women in old-timey clothes were making biscuits. Keith wanted Sammy to join the other women. Sammy had never made anything but prison spreads. She could whip up a prison cheesecake from Sprite and non-dairy creamers, or tamales from canteen Doritos that were soaked in water and hand pulped to masa. She stood awkwardly, wishing she had worn long sleeves to hide her prison tattoos. I love your tan, one of the white women told Sammy <laughs> as she rolled out her white biscuit dough. The men were firing cannons. One blew into a bugle. Keith was a pretend captain in the pretend army and won a real sword that day. He had to get rid of it, Sammy explained, while they were on the long drive back to Hanford. She was a level four on parole, no firearms, and no knives over 10 inches long, or she would go right back to prison. Ah, oh, darn it. Keith blew air and flapped his lips like a child, like a Keith something who lives in a dream, gets himself a Serenia from Stanville, takes her to a picnic where white people admire her tan. But after that, Keith never took her anywhere. He only left the house himself one evening a week, Sundays, when he worked as a volunteer security guard at the Red Cross. He made a big deal about it, always took a briefcase with him, and said it held important documents that he needed to study for his next Daytona run. It wasn't really a briefcase. It was the emptied container for a backgammon set. <laughs> Once, Sammy opened it. It was filled with candy bars. Sammy had no money, no car, was trapped with a meat-headed half-wit in an apartment next to a feedlot. Keith spent his days swiveling left and right in a chair, like he was on the racetrack that was inside his TV. He wore a shiny Daytona race shirt that said Pennzoil over the shoulder. Sammy started asking him for money. He reluctantly gave her a few ones. She would walk to the dollar store, buy a quart of malt liquor, drink it while talking to the farm workers who lived in the shacks behind the parking lot. One night, she came home drunk. Keith was swerving in his chair as race cars jerked around the track on TV. Sammy could not take it anymore. She picked up a heavy glass ashtray and beamed him with it, then ran from the apartment. She was a fugitive with no place to go. At a railroad crossing, she heard a siren in the distance. She hid behind a switching box, waiting for the sound to fade, and then followed the train tracks. She got to the freeway and stood on the southbound shoulder until she found a ride. Sammy knew Skid Row, had survived there on and off between prison stints, and that was where she went. It was a place where a person could disappear if she was careful. She managed to elude arrest for several months, but eventually got picked up in a sweep. Keith pressed charges, but they never went through a divorce proceeding, and as far as Sammy knew, she was still married to this idiot country boy living right close by. And then I'll just read one more short section. Um, I, th there are some good men in this book, but the, <laughs> but the ones I've chosen for tonight haven't come across so well. Oh, oops. Um, this is from very late in the book, and this is Kurt Kennedy, um, who had an unfortunate entanglement with the narrator, Romy. He would not call it loaded how he felt when he got on the plane. He was only starting to relax. He'd been on edge the whole time in Cancun. It was supposed to be a vacation, but minute by minute, he kept checking in with himself to find out if he was having fun, and he didn't know, and this made him anxious, so he took another clonopin and lay down or got up or went to the bar or walked around on the sand, but it burned his feet, and he had to face down the fact that he was not a beachy-type person and just wanted to get home and go to the Mars room and see Vanessa put her body on his lap. It was the only way in the world he knew to get peace. Every person deserves peace. He meant whether anyone deserves anything is beside the point. He needed certain things to feel okay. Vanessa was among those things. He needed dark and heavy curtains because he had a sleeping problem. 
He needed Oxycontin because he had a pain problem. He needed liquor because he had a drinking problem. Money because he had a living problem. And show him someone who doesn't need money. He needed this girl because he had a girl problem. Problem was maybe the wrong word. He had a focus. Her name was Vanessa. That was her stage name, but for him it was her name name because it was the one he got to know her by. Vanessa filled in around all the hazier thoughts in his mind with something that was specific and real. When he was near her, he felt good. Every person deserves to feel good, especially him, since he was himself. There was a couple next to him on the plane turned inward to each other like they didn't really want to talk, but he tried anyway. Sometimes shooting the breeze with people kills time. He told them about his boat, and he didn't actually have a boat, but he'd been talking for so long like he did have a boat that he basically, at this point, owned a boat. But they weren't interested, so he turned to the kid across the aisle, started telling him about his boat. Sometimes he thought of people as kid, called grown men kid, but this kid was a kid kid, Kurt realized. How old are you, he asked. 13. Nice. Kurt said it with a way to go, all right kind of tone. Kids like to be encouraged. He was rewarding this kid for being 13. 13 was puberty, old enough to get off. He'd like to show the kid a picture of Vanessa. There was a porn actress who looked a bit like her, but he didn't have a photo of the actress either. A woman came up the aisle and leaned over the kid. Kid got up from his seat. A man came up the aisle and sat where the kid had been. They were a family and they were switching. Nice knowing you, Kurt said, and the kid said, you too. No one would talk to him or rather listen, so he got his book out, Chicken Hawk, a Vietnam thing he'd been trying to read for three years. It interested him because he had begun long ago telling people he was in combat, but he never was. He was stationed in Germany. The book was about a helicopter pilot, and Kurt wasn't even halfway through. Because it was taking him so long to read and was a secondhand copy with cheap paper, he kept it in a Ziploc bag. He read a few pages on the airplane as he sipped his rum and coke, but reading was difficult for him. The problem with reading was how relentless it was. You managed to concentrate long enough to read a whole paragraph, and then there was another one, and they just kept coming. He did it mainly as an act for the other people on the plane, except no one was watching him or noticing. He put Chicken Hawk back in the Ziploc. He could not get his screen to work, so he closed his eyes and planned for when he'd be home and could go see Vanessa. The first time Kurt ever saw her, he had been keeping company with a hothead named Angelique. He and Angelique were dancing in the tunnel thing at the back of the Mars room. They called it dancing, but the whole time you're just trying to rub up on them. There was another couple in the tunnel thing, a businessman and Vanessa. Her body was pressed against the businessman. She danced with the guy like she really meant it. She was glued to this man in a suit in her bra and underwear. Angelique said loudly that Vanessa was breaking a rule and was she high, what drug was she on because you can't fuck in the tunnel. It was fine to massage men's laps with your buttocks but if you did that frontally, other girls would get on your case. Yeah, I'm high, Vanessa said, swaying into the businessman. It's a drug called happiness. You should try it sometime. She continued to grind into the businessman, the man himself taking no notice of the argument between the two women, and instead moving against pretty Vanessa like a man might dance with his wife on their golden anniversary, or in a TV commercial spotlighting an occasion like that to sell Viagra. <laughs> Kurt thought it was funny. Later, Vanessa passed him on the aisle, and he told her so. She said, I don't like to talk, but if you want a lap dance, I'm 20 a song. So he gave her an Andrew Jackson, as the girls called them, and that's how it started. The usual way it started with any girl at the Mars room, except this chick was not using him for the money. Something was happening between them. They all did a stage show, or were supposed to, and when it was Vanessa's turn, he sat closer to the stage than usual. When Angelique saw him alone and tried to offer company, he told her to get lost. Vanessa had a song that was clearly hers to perform to. She moved inside the song like it was about her. The singer had a weird voice. 
Kurt didn't know if it was a man or a woman, and that seemed pretty odd, but it fit with this chick, even if she herself was 100% girl. Come on down to my place, baby. We'll talk about love. Vanessa wore mirrored sunglasses that gave a comic edge to her performance. She put her legs up, and they were the most gorgeous legs he'd ever seen. Some of the girls there had pale and flabby legs, shapeless tubes that reminded him of glass syringes. Vanessa's legs were leg legs, long and tapered. It was a joke, comedy, that this world-class chick was on stage at the Mars Room. He was in on it, you better believe it. She was high on life the way everyone ought to try sometime, but hadn't or couldn't because they were not free the way she was, this sexy chick with her amazing legs. Cute ass. Her tits were cute too, grabbable, handful size. And then she showed the whole thing, bending upside down from behind. That was his favorite, the way it all looks suspended from behind when they bend over. She was doing it just for him. She knew, this chick really knew. That was the thing about Vanessa. She wasn't an idiot barking up the wrong tree. It was all the right tree. She understood how to turn him on and she was doing it. She sat with him when her stage show was over. Know what I like about you? It was a setup for him to answer his own question, everything. He liked to be the one to do the talking. He felt good with her. He felt comfortable. He loved to touch her. His hands were everywhere. He gave her 20 after 20, went out and got more money and gave her that, got more and gave her that too because he really, really, really liked this girl. He started going more frequently to the Mars room. He was on workman's comp and had a lot of free time and he was under a spell. He spent everything on this girl. All she had to do was turn and look at him, seated in his lap, and he'd hand over the bills. Before he'd gotten his job as a process server, which paid well but almost killed him, he had worked security for the Warfield Theater, which was a block down market from the Mars Room. Boy, did he have stories. Eight nights of the Jerry Garcia Band, ten nights of Jerry Garcia. Pathetic hippies would camp out on the broad sidewalk make their own disgusting street village with drumming and people freaking out on drugs, and security had to keep clearing out their encampment and maintain order. He was still friendly enough with some of the security guys at the war field, and when he started going to the Mars room, he parked in front of the theater and asked them to watch his bike. There were women in San Francisco who rode motorcycles. This bothered him because women, how did they understand the physics of it? If you don't get physics, you can't be in control of speed wouldn't catch Vanessa riding any motorcycle. She wore little high-heeled shoes and short dresses when she was leaving the Mars room. He could put her on the back, though, teach her how to hold on tight, lean with him as he leaned. So many broads didn't even know how to be a passenger, lean the wrong way when he cornered. Hold on like you're part of this, he tried to explain, but they didn't get it. He was supposed to be at home recovering from his accident, but he got bored at home. He'd crashed outside the projects on Potrero Hill and mangled his leg, slid all the way across the intersection with his knee trapped underneath the very large and heavy gas tank of his K-100, had four operations and walked now with a limp. They called it an accident, but to Kurt, it was attempted murder. Kids in the projects had dumped motor oil in the middle of the street so he would wipe out. He had tried to serve legal documents, simply doing his job, to an address in the projects repeatedly without luck. On his sixth visit, he knew, as soon as he hit the intersection and went into a slide, what they'd done to him. But there was no way to find the actual kids and prove it. He was stuck at home, waiting for his knee to heal. He was told it might not. His apartment on Woodside became a waiting room with no end to the waiting. He would shuffle around, sit on his couch, flip through a magazine, change the TV channel, stare into the fridge, watch cars move down the street, do his 10 exercises, watch cars try to parallel park. Hardly anyone knew how to parallel park. He'd sit on the bed, read the same sentence over and over in his book, Chicken Hawk, realize he was doing that, put the book in its Ziploc, change TV channels, and finally get up, ride over to the Mars room, and limp in to see if Vanessa was working. He knew a lot of girls there now, but the only one he liked was Vanessa. He told her he was a homicide investigator. 
It wasn't a total lie. He wanted to investigate the kids who tried to kill him by putting a lake of motor oil in the intersection near the projects. He had learned not to tell people he was a process server because when he explained how you serve papers, the tactics you are forced to use, it didn't sound noble. People treated him like he was some kind of scumbag repo man. He talked to Vanessa about all the tensions in his life without giving details. He talked and talked. He touched her bare skin with his hands and said things, expressed feelings, and got attached. He got attached to her. Thank you.